All right, good morning, church. Good morning, visitors. Everybody here on Easter Sunday, thank the Lord that you're here. They're playing choir calling music, so if you're a church member, you sing in the choir, you like singing sing in the choir, you're a visitor and you'd like to sing with us today, we welcome you all. Come up, take a seat. Let's fill up as many as we can and sing it to His glory today. church. He is risen. Amen. 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 We gather and celebrate the empty tomb this morning. Um, However, uh, he was risen yesterday. He's still going to be risen tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day on until eternity. Right. So we gather this morning. uh, Special welcome to our visitors. Um, For our visitors, we'll ask if you guys would just fill out that visitor card in the little pocket of the seat in front of you. We would love to have record that you are here. We're not going to show up at your house this week unless you're cooking like meatloaf or something. Um, But for the most part, we're not going to show up and knock on your door. We just want to have record that you are here and send you guys a postcard saying thank you for joining us for worship this morning because we are so glad you are here. Your seats have been prayed over. Um, Know that you are here this morning on a divine appointment with God the Father who has orchestrated this gathering this morning for you to hear the preached and proclaimed gospel of Jesus Christ and that there is forgiveness for you this morning. There is grace for you this morning. I'll have you turn to the bulletin very quickly just so I can point out a couple things for you. Joy Group on April 21st is going to be meeting for supper. Sorry, last week I said dinner. My mistake. It won't happen again. Um, However, there is no evening service tonight. Uh, You guys enjoy Easter as families go hunt some eggs. And then next Sunday night, we're going to be doing a joint service with Trinity Baptist Church um, here at 6 p.m. Funds for that. It's going to be a little fundraiser night uh, to raise money to send kids to FCA camp. So we are super excited for that. We ask that you guys come. Worship with sort of our sister church as we uh, gather and, and hear the word preached and proclaimed together. Um, Splash Gordon, if you guys can see right there, early sign up through April 30th. It's creeping up on us, and we want you guys to sign up so that we can show Christ to the people here in our community. Um, A lot of the time we have a heart and a focus for reaching other countries, which is amazing and part of the Great Commission, but also part of the Great Commission is reaching people here in our own community. So we want to make sure that we are being good stewards of that this morning. So um, this morning I want to read very, very quickly. From John 19, Uh, we were talking about it this morning with our students in Sunday school, and uh, it really just kind of jumped off the page to me, and I I wanted to kind of highlight this very quickly. Um, It's not the part of the crucifixion story you would think I would read this morning, um, but John 19, verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. But Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. What was initially written as a joke or a smug remark about who Jesus was turned out to be the truth. And it hung over our king on the cross that this is the king of the Jews. And he reigns this morning and he was reigning then on the cross. So we're going to pray, we're going to stand, and we're going to join for worship. Father God, we come. God, we thank you for meeting us here this morning. God, we thank you for the empty tomb. God, we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and pay the payment we could never afford. God, we know that you are good, you are gracious, and you are merciful. God, every person here this morning, whether they be visitor, church member, God, we know that they are here to hear from you. God, bless our speaker this morning that he unleashes the word in this place. God, that hearts are convicted, prodigals brought back home, and unbelievers are regenerated this morning. 
God, the empty tomb is a symbol of resurrection. God, it's a miracle we can experience now in this place this morning, God. So we just ask that you have complete and total control over what you're going to do here in this place. Father, it is all in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray and ask these things. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 How many of you came to worship a risen Savior today? Amen. Let's do it. Because He lives. Page 296. Let's sing to his greatness. Just that last verse, page number 
out there, so good to see each and every one of you here. And I know that we have a lot of visitors. We have some family members here. If you have most or all of your family together with you today, would you raise your hand today? All right. Amen. I know we have some. <laughs> You're just shy today. All right. We're thankful to have you here, visitors. Please just, just relax. Just open up. Let the Lord have your heart today, and let's just worship and adore Him on this celebration of His resurrection today. How many of you love the Lord today? Amen. All right. So glad to see some I hadn't seen in a while. I see Margaret Cleary back there. Margaret, so good to see you, and I know there's others as well. Um, we talked to Brother Hare yesterday, and Evan talked to him this morning. I'm sure he's watching from Facebook today. And uh, he was feeling good today, Brother Nevin said. He had his dialysis yesterday. He's eating well. Um, they love the facility where they're taking dialysis there near home. They love their home health caregiver who's helping him rehab and get physically strong. Please continue to pray for him as well as many others in our church today. Well, my prayer, my hope today. Oh, so let me say this too. We welcome Bruce White and his wife, Wendy. They come to us all the way from South Carolina today. and Bruce has been here before. He's one of Brother Walter. I know you're used to this term. He calls you his preacher boy. One of those who answered his call under his ministry. And he's a preaching machine. And I don't want to put any pressure on you, but he is this morning. And uh, we're so thankful for having them here with us and, and uh, just catching up with them a little bit there. But, uh, you know, my, my hope, my wish would be today that Every person in this world would hear the gospel message today. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, the, the Catholic Pope, he stands at that Vatican, and they just, they just crowd that courtyard. He speaks, what, one time a year? And it's broadcast in almost every language known to humans. And, and boy, I just wish one time today he would say uh, uh, what, John, what the, the Lord said over there in, in the chapter number 3 of John. He said, for God sent not his son to condemn the world that the world through him might be saved. You know why he goes on to say, he said, because those that don't believe are condemned already. Amen. Oh, I see some others I hadn't seen in a while. So good to see you. Let's just worship the Lord today. In Christ alone, our hope is found. In Christ alone, the wrath of God will satisfy. In Christ alone, sin's curse has lost its victory. Aren't you thankful for that today? Sing it with us, church. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when things are still, when striving cease, I know the I know in all, here is the love of Christ, I say. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was
Commands my destiny, and no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever part me from His hand till He returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand till all the cross.
suffered it all. Because he loved me. you thankful that Jesus did the ultimate for us. He, he proved it. He did the ultimate thing that anyone could do to prove their love for humanity. Oh, but He didn't stay dead, did He? And He won't stay gone. He's coming back. Well, we're missing one hair this morning, but we've still got one with us today. <laughs> Brother Jonathan, and uh, just continue to keep your, open, your hearts open, uh, both to be ministered to and to worship the Lord today. Jonathan's going to sing an old classic, Had It Not Been. Oh. And then Miss Morgan's going to come and she's going to sing the Hallelujah Chorus, the Easter version. And again, just worship, continue to worship the Lord today. Just suppose. God searched through heaven and couldn't find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed. Just to buy eternal life for you and me. And had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary. And had it not been for the old rugged cross. Had it not been for a man called Jesus, well, then forever my soul would be lost. I'm so glad he was willing to drink his bitter cup. Although he prayed, Father, let it pass from me. And I'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels. From these hands, pull the nails that torment me. For a place called Mount Calvary Then had it not been For the old rugged cross And had it not been For a man called Jesus Well then forever Well, then forever my soul would be lost. 
will then forever my soul would be
morning. It's good to see all of you here at the house of God this morning. It's, it's an joy to be here and see each one of you on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. I'm glad, to, as Brother Jonathan said, if it hadn't been for a man called Jesus, then forever would be lost. You know, I thought many a time he could have came and died, and if that had been it, that would just been like anybody else dying. But he came and finished the whole work. He said it was finished when he rose from Calvary's cross. And I'm glad we serve a risen Savior this morning. And as I talked to Brother Walter this morning, he said, I'm feeling some better. I'm a little stronger. And he said, you tell Brother Bruce just to turn loose and preach. And so I told Brother Bruce that's what we want him to do, just turn loose and preach and let the Lord have his way. And if you're visiting here this morning, we hope you feel a good welcome here. Warm welcome from Newtown Baptist Church because we always want you to be welcome and come anytime. So at this time, let's give a good warm welcome to Brother Bruce White. God bless you. Thank you so much. Good to see everyone this morning. If you will, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter number 12. And while you're turning there, I just want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to come and fill in today for your pastor. I love him so much. He and Mary Ruth and the family have known him for 40 years, 40 years. It's hard to believe that time has passed by uh, that quickly, but I can remember in September of 1981 or 82, a little over 40 years, um, I walked into Temple Baptist Church. He was the pastor there, and I met Brother Walter. He's been very dear to my heart ever since, like a father and uh, has been such a help down through the years in the ministry. And uh, he always did say, he said, now you get up and preach and let go and let God have his way, but just stay with the book. And so he always taught us to stay with the word of God. And Jonathan, that was such a good uh, song you sang a few minutes ago. And Wendy and I were sitting there thinking about how much you look like your dad when he was your age. And, and uh, that's a compliment. And, uh, but we love Brother Walter. We're praying for you, Brother Walter. I know you're listening. And uh, we love you. We pray that God will restore your health uh, really soon. Matthew chapter number 12 this morning, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 38. Verse number 38, if you'd like to stand, if that is your uh, tradition, and let's uh, read beginning with verse number 38 through verse number 41. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want you to see a sign or we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale or the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. I want to preach to you a message entitled The Threefold Message of Jonah. The Threefold Message of Jonah. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning just thanking you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, that you've brought us together today to celebrate the resurrected Lord. Father, we pray specifically for Brother Walter that you might bring healing to his body and restore him, Lord, to the pulpit soon. We thank you, God, for his family and the testimony, the example, Lord, that they've set down through the years. Lord, we ask that you bless this church this morning. We pray, God, that you'll have your will and your way. Be with your servant, Lord. Give me the words that I need to say. May I speak the truth in love. And Lord, we pray, may the Holy Spirit of God speak to us and move upon us today in conviction and power. Bring the backslider home, Lord, and I pray that you'll save that soul which is nearest eternity. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory for what you do in and through our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The Bible is absolutely and abundantly clear that all men are sinners. 
Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. Chapter 3, verse 10, and chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is holy and man is unholy. And there's a great gulf between God and man. Psalm 14, verse 3, the Bible says, All have turned away and have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Then Isaiah caps it off by saying in chapter number 64, verse number 6, that all our righteousness, all the good moral efforts that we have, all of our righteousness is as a filthy rag, or all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment when we're compared to the holiness of God. Over and over again, the scripture points to the lostness and the corruptness of mankind, the lostness of, and corruptness of man's heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number nine. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? Ephesians chapter two, the apostle Paul says this, that we're without God and without hope. The psalmist said in sin, my mother conceived me. Ephesians 2, verse number 1, the Apostle Paul says, We are dead in trespasses and sins. We're born into sin, condemned by sin nature. Spiritually speaking, we're dead. But in verse number 4, God said, But God in His mercy, but God, God divinely and supernaturally intervened on behalf of man. Now when I think of the lostness of a person, the lostness of a person is not always visible. It's not always apparent to another person. When the men come into our ministry at the Haven of Rest, they come through those doors broken and battered and ruined by sin. Their minds are cracked. Their families are torn to pieces. And it's very evident as to who they are spiritually. They're lost. They're sinners. You see it on their body, you see it in their face. Their lives are ruined. But there are many who are not as visible and apparent to another. It's not always easy to determine how sinful a person really is. Because there's in this, there is in this world, uh, the world of humanity, a sort of relative goodness. A basic moral soundness in many people's lives. Good people who say they believe in God and do good things, and are kind to others. But ultimately, the sinfulness of man is always made manifest and brought to light under one condition. And I want you to listen. And at this point, it becomes unavoidable and explicit. The sinfulness of man is clearly seen when a person comes face to face with the person of Jesus Christ. At that point, there can be no hiding it. At that point, all the masks fall away. At that point, the veneers fail and the religious camouflage is crushed and is of no effect for the reality of one's sinful heart is in direct confrontation with the person of Jesus Christ. And then the sin issue is crystallized when one is face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of glory, that perfect one. John 16, verse number eight, the primary responsibility of the Holy Spirit of God and the primary work of the Spirit of God in this world is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. The first part of coming to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ is realizing our lostness before God. Now the setting is the Jewish leaders in chapter number 12. The Jewish leaders appeared to be holy. The Jewish leaders appeared to be righteous. They were the very religious crowd and the religious upper crust of the community. And on the surface, surface they loved God. On the surface, they obeyed God. 
On the surface, it seemed to be that they kept and guarded the law of God. They were the most religious people in the world at that time, and nobody really knew the utter vileness and the sinfulness because of the mask of religion which they wore so well. But when Jesus came on the scene, why, he confronted the reality of their plight. It didn't matter what else they pretended to be. It was absolutely clear as to how sinful and wicked they were. And Jesus pronounced judgment on them in Matthew chapter 23. And the Lord calls them whited sepulchers that appear to be right on the outside, but in man, inside they're dead men's bones. He called them brood of snakes and evil and vile and perverted and wicked men with black hearts and poisonous mouths. And in our text, the previous verses, these scribes and these Pharisees are plotting against our Lord. They're plotting against Him. They're seeking to trip Him up, questioning His loyalty to the law. In the first few verses, the disciples are hungry. And so on the Sabbath day, they go and pluck some corn off the stalks in order to eat. And the scribes and the Pharisees find that as a place in which they can accuse the Lord and said, is it lawful to do that? on the Sabbath day. Then a man needed healing on the Sabbath day and Jesus came on the scene and he did what he did and that is he worked a miracle and brought healing to the man's body. A man who was demonized and filled with devils, Jesus cast the demons out. A man that possessed blindness and was mute and possessed by the devil and Jesus healed him and now he sees and he hears and he speaks. But verse number 24, they attributed that work to the work of Beelzebub, that is Satan. Then in verse number 38, they come with a, with a, with a, 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 a tongue-in-cheek, a, a, an attitude of, Lord, just show us a sign. Give us a sign, verse number 38. Give us a sign that you are who you say you are. Teacher, prove to us you are who you really are. The truth is Christ had given them the forerunner, John the Baptist, the prophet, John the Baptist, but they rejected his prophet. The truth is the Lord had exemplified his supremacy and his omnipotence throughout the many miracles that he had worked before them, before their eyes, yet they rejected his power. Our Lord had presented himself and his principles in the Sermon on the Mount and throughout the Gospels, yet they rejected his person. And so verse number 39, he brings about a judgment. He says, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. This generation will be given no sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now what is that? What about the prophet Jonah? What is so significant regarding that Old Testament story in this particular setting? This would have been very familiar to the scribes and the Pharisees for they knew the law, they knew the stories of the Old Testament and they knew them well. So Christ points to this Old Testament to shed light on the message of salvation. And always when we look back to the Old Testament, Romans chapter 15, verse number uh, 4, the Bible says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. And I want to tell you, we're, when we're faced with such difficult times, when we're faced when the family is being shredded in our culture and our land, when we're faced with all the uncertainties around us with war and rumors of war and the sickening uh, uh, belief system of our society, if there's ever a time that this generation needs hope, it's today and our hope is in Christ and Christ alone. And so we look to the scripture to find the hope that we need today. And the glorious resurrection day is all about hope and life. So what do we mean when we say, what does he mean when he says the only sign you're going to have is the sign of Jonah? Well, we all know the story of Jonah. If you've been in church any time at all, you know the story of Jonah. What is it about the sign of Jonah? Well, I believe there's a threefold message here that God wants us to get a hold of this morning. And I want you to know, first of all, it's a message of retribution. It's a message of judgment. 
You'll find in Jonah chapter number one, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you. Verse number two, he told Jonah, he said, you arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. That's what he said. He said, go out and cry out to them. Now we know the story, how that Jonah, he, he, rather than uh, rising up and, and shipping out he, or, and going to Nineveh, he, he, he fled to Tarshish, shipped to Tarshish. He became the prodigal preacher. Well, we know how the story goes and how God rescued him through the great fish, the whale, and how that God allowed him to be uh, 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 saved through that. And, and uh, then in chapter number four, what do we find? Chapter number four, we could go through the whole story, that's a sermon in itself. But it, the Bible says in verse three, the, chapter three, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise and go to Nineveh. God gave him a second chance. And he said, go and preach the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceedingly great city, a three days journey. And Jonah began to enter the city the first day's walk and he cried out and said, yet 40 days, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So when we look at the sign of Jonah, and we see the message of Jonah, we first of all see a message of retribution and judgment. God commanded him to preach to Nineveh. And just like the wicked and perverse generation to whom the Lord was referring in Matthew chapter number 12, Nineveh was a vile and sinful wicked nation. Their wickedness had reached the nostrils of God and God had had enough. And he said, judgment's coming. And it was the responsibility of the prophet. It was the responsibility of the preacher to stand up and warn the nation of pending retribution. And as we go, we see how that Jonah preached and Nineveh responded. And they responded with belief. Now, undoubtedly, we're living in a day much like Nineveh, aren't we? Undoubtedly, we're living in a day of, of wickedness where the wickedness of man has reached a boiling point. It can no longer be considered here where we live. It can no longer be considered a Christian nation, but rather a post-Christian society. A culture that is bent on self-deification. A society that is built on self-indulgence and self-destruction and by blindly leading to self-destruction. You cannot make the void, you cannot make void the law of God and expect anything else but to reap what we've sown. There will come a time before his return. I believe that there'll come a time before his return that we'll begin to see God separate the true from the false. Persecution and hostility on the outside of the church has always brought about a purification of the church. And it has a purifying effect. It will always expose the reality of one's conversion. And the day of compromise and weakness and apostasy is here. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, the Bible says that there will be the falling away. And we're seeing the falling away. But thanks be unto God, the next prophetical uh, uh, seen on, on God's calendar on his prophetical calendar is the coming of the Lord the rapture of the church the first phase of his coming he'll catch us up in the air and sometime later seven years later we'll come with him and he'll set his foot upon this earth and rule with a rod of iron the focus that I want to talk to you in regards to judgment this morning I got to hurry I, know I want to be respectful of your time but the day of the Lord, the final judgment is coming. And it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And I want you to notice, now get your ears on this morning. Satan has deceived and Satan has convinced that there's no such thing as a future judgment. Satan has deceived and convinced many, perhaps even sitting right here, that there's no final accounting. There's no worry about future consequences. Just live as you please and do as you want and call on the name of the Lord when you get some Facebook religion and just ask everybody to pray, but never, ever, ever live out the reality of the gospel. Man is not really responsible. 
how we live or the direction we take or the decisions we make. But Jude chapter number 15, the Bible's very plain that one day we're gonna face God. One day we're gonna see the risen Lord. One day we're gonna stand before God in judgment. And the Bible says in verse number 15 that when he comes, he will execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them, all their ungodly deeds which they've committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You will one day stand before a holy God and give an account. That's what the scripture says. Oh, I want you to notice There's a belief system of atheism that there is no God. There's a belief system of humanism that man is his own God and he sets his own standards and his values. Then there's evolution that man is really not a man, he's an animal. You know, once I was a tadpole beginning to begin. Then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey in a banyan tree and now I'm a professor with a PhD. (laughs) That's the mindset of this world. He should not be responsible because of his innate passions and desires. They're all a result uh, and actions uh, uh, that are surfacing for him from his prehistoric roots. But worst of all, a social gospel that is peddled and preached in churches week after week after week that only paints the love of God and excludes the holiness of God. But this same Jesus, the one who wept over Jerusalem with compassion and love and mercy, also says, depart from me, ye cursed. He came to seek and to serve that which was, he came to seek and to serve and he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But he's also coming in clouds of glory with judgment making war. He himself will tread the winepress of the fearness of the wrath of Almighty God and I want you to know one day he's coming in spite of the scorn, in spite of the ridicule, in spite of the liberal theologians, in spite of the laughter of Hollywood. There is a final judgment. There is a day of reckoning and Amos chapter four verse number 12 declares that we should prepare to meet thy God. On September the 11th, many years ago, the greatest tragedy on American soul took place. We were totally unprepared for that day. Unexpected, deadly events changed our lives forever. And there are many right here this morning, you spend your lives daily preparing, taking steps to make life better, putting things in order here and there, but fail to get your spiritual house in order for the inevitable reality that one day you're gonna meet God. This is all temporary. This is like a vapor. We're here and we're gone. The psalmist said it's like a brief flood after a rain. And James said it's a vapor. You're only here for a moment and then you'll stand before your creator in judgment. Prepare to meet your God at an appointed time when the sure ultimate confrontation will take place Are you ready this morning? Are you ready? Can you face God this morning with assurance, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, or will you face Him clothed in your own sin and guilt? But I want you to notice not only is it a message of retribution, but I want you to follow along. I want you to notice it's a message of redemption. Verse number 40, I want you to notice what the Bible says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Our Lord points to the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is your sign. You'll notice they didn't work any more miracles among them after that. As far as the blind seeing and the lame walking. No, this was it. This is your sign. This is it. This is all we're giving you. This is it. A message of redemption. Within these verses we find encompass the atonement of Christ. The work of Christ in salvation. The most important subject in the Bible is the atonement. If you miss the atonement, you miss heaven and you'll die in your sin separated from God for eternity. It's the heart, soul, and lifeblood of Christianity. No spiritual experience is legitimate. No salvation is genuine. And no religion or denomination is reliable unless its roots and source of strength is anchored in the Jesus of Calvary. And to remove the atonement of Christ from Scripture and to delete it from our preaching and to minimize its importance when conveying the message of Christianity is like having a body without a spirit, a tree without a root, and a vehicle without an engine. 
It's the central theme. The key subject of Christianity is 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Every Sunday morning, church, I want you to listen to me. Every Sunday morning you meet at Newtown Baptist Church, every Sunday morning is an Easter celebration. It's a reminder that the Lord of glory, the Savior of man, the Redeemer, the Forgiver, the spotless Lamb of God came to this earth humbling himself in the likeness of man, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. Every sin you've ever committed, every sin I've ever committed, past, present, and future, were nailed to the cross that day. He bore our sin in his body on the tree. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom. He lived. He lived a life we could not live. He died our death and he rose again. And Though the Lord Jesus Christ experienced the death on Calvary and then was placed in a borrowed tomb, he came forth victoriously from the tomb. And because he lives, as you sang a little while ago, I can face tomorrow. You and I can rest the past you and I can have direction for the future. You and I can have hope as we face uncertain days. His bodily resurrection is no fairy tale. His bodily resurrection is not some psychological crutch we as Christians lean upon in hard times. It is an absolute happening that took place just as the Bible said. He shed his blood on Calvary for our sins. He died our death. And though his enemies thought that they had won. Though all hell had clapped and cheered on the third day when the dust settled and light began to dawn up from the grave, he arose carrying the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he is alive. The resurrection assures his bodily return. Verse 23 and 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I won't take time to turn there, but we see the signs of the times all around us. And one day he'll come in clouds of glory. That's an absolute fact. Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus told the disciples in John 14, If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Resurrection assures that Christ is coming again. This isn't it, folks. This is not it. He's coming. And these are perilous days. These are difficult times. And God said they're going to get worse. They're going to continue to get worse. And people will be deceived and being deceived. But he said to you and I, but continue thou in the things of which you've learned and been assured of. You don't let up. You don't turn aside. The resurrection of the Lord ensures the coming of the Lord. The resurrection of the Lord assures those who are in Christ that they will one day come forth. And what is sown in corruption, when we bury somebody that we love and we bury somebody in the ground and we say goodbye to them, as a believer, we sorrow with a sorrow that is accompanied with hope, not as the sorrow that the world experiences, but a sorrow that is accompanied with assurance and hope that Christ is coming again and one day that body is gonna rise. And the scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Our soul goes on to be with God the moment that we die. Death is no king of terror to a believer. To somebody who is in Christ, resurrection assures life for you and I. Resurrection assures the end of death itself. Revelation 21.4. God gives us a glimpse of what it's going to be like. He said, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eye. And there'll be no more pain, no death, no crying. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no, all the former things have passed away. And then he said in verse 12, Behold, I make all things new. Thank God. As sure as Christ came forth out of the grave, he's coming for his bride in the sky. He's preparing a place for his children. And I'm not looking for signs anymore. I'm listening for a shout. I'm waiting on the trumpet to sound. And I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go this morning? As sure as Christ came forth, he's coming again. Where there'll be no sorrow, no pain, no tears, no bereavement, no grief, no goodbyes, no grave scenes. Now the question again, now listen as I bring it to a close. Can you face eternity with assurance and steadfastness? Can you face eternity with hope? 
faith and hope and assurance that is anchored in the one who conquered death, hell, and the grave. The last thing I want to share with you this morning is the message of Jonah is not only a message of retribution, that judgments are coming. The judgment of the nations, the judgment of the ungodly, the judgment seat of Christ for believers, I'm telling you this morning, it's coming as sure as you're sitting there. Judgment's coming. But God has made redemption and salvation and forgiveness available We're living in the grace age where God is reaching out in His love and compassion and He's restoring. Listen, He's restoring men and women and boys and girls to God through the person of Jesus Christ and His sacrificial work on the cross, the atoning work of Christ. That's the message of the gospel. It's the good news. But I want you to notice this message is a message of repentance and restoration. You'll notice in Jonah chapter number 3, He says, that in chapter 3, and when Jonah preached, the Bible says in verse number 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Matthew chapter 12, the men of Nineveh, verse 41, will rise up in judgment, in the judgment, with this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Not only is the message of Jonah a a, a message of retribution and a message of redemption, but it's a message of repentance and restoration. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of the mind and the heart that has resulted in the direction and action that you take. It's as simple as that. It's an important part of salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, for, the, for by grace you are saved through faith and true biblical faith is synonymous with repentance. The Bible in every situation and circumstance when there was a conversion experience, there was repentance involved. After they heard the word of truth in Ephesians, they trusted the Lord Jesus. They came to Him. They turned from their pagans. The knowledge and responding to what you hear. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, the scripture says they uh, did not hear the scripture only in word, did they understand it in word indeed, but in power of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, they brought in their idols and they turned from their idols to worship the true and living God. Repentance was the theme of Christ's preaching in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And godly sorrow works repentance, but worldly sorrow brings about remorse. We're living in a sorrowful world. We're living in where people are waking up in the wickedness and the vileness of this world, and they're sorrowful. But biblical sorrow, godly sorrow, will work repentance. You'll turn around from the way you're going. You'll turn from something to something, from hell to heaven, from darkness to light. That's biblical repentance. Unless you do that, the Bible says you'll all likewise perish. The theme of John the Baptist's preaching was also repentance. He said, bring forth fruits of repentance. And he wasn't preaching to the winos. He wasn't preaching to the bums or the drug dealers or the drag queens. But he was preaching to the religious crowd. He was preaching to the synagogue goers, the tithers. So that was the theme of John the Baptist. That's why they hated him, beheaded him. They hated him and then beheaded him because he preached the truth. But I want you to notice it was the theme of the Apostle Paul. Now come here just a minute. They rejoiced that their sorrow had led them to repentance. And it is the most wonderful thing to see our men come in with their lives so broken and ruined by sin. And you see the tears of remorse. And many times those tears are worldly sorrow. But then when you give them Jesus and you give them the gospel and they begin to to the word of God those tears turn into a godly sorrow and I see repentance in their life and I see a change of life a change of direction and now some of our young men are now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ Luke chapter 15 there's more joy in heaven when one sinner repents you want to get joyful get somebody to come to Jesus repent of their sins there's going to be joy in heaven Oh, listen, more rejoice in heaven. Genuine biblical repentance will bring joy in heaven. 
You can't make repentance void in the Christian life. It's a part of initial salvation. It's a continual characteristic for you and I as believers in our practice as believers throughout the walk of sanctification. Because when things enter our life, we belong to the Lord and whom the Lord loves, He chastens, He disciplines us. And the first thing we need when the Holy Spirit begins to knock on our door about something in our lives, we're to respond and say yes to Jesus and walk with Him and learn from that and, and, and grow out of our strongholds and our difficulties. When it comes to the spiritual walk with the Lord, the Holy Spirit calls the church to repent. What's the one thing repentance cannot do though? And I leave you with this and we're going to close and have an invitation and I know you want to spend time with your families but I want you to listen to me. What is the one thing, listen church, that repentance cannot do? We see the blessings. I see the joy on faces. I see the benefits and the fruits of one who has had a burden lifted and whose walk now exemplifies that of a believer. I see the power of change in their life and their family. I see families restored. But what is one thing repentance cannot do? And I want every young person to listen to me. One thing repentance cannot do, it cannot halt the consequences of a wasted life. It cannot replace missed opportunity. It cannot turn back the clock and rescue your past. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 in verse number one. The Bible's very plain. Ecclesiastes 12 in verse number one, and I want you to listen to me. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. You have an opportunity and God teaches us while we're young, remember God. Don't wait till life passes you by. Don't wait till you get old because repentance can't bring that time back. Oh, it'll start a new life and it'll make you ready for heaven. But I want you to know, I look at some of our older men who have come to Christ and I see the joy in their face and the joy in their eye, but I also see the regret of life lost. Time. I wished I'd have met him earlier. Remember now, while you're young, stop your foolishness. Stop your drunkenness. Stop your drugs. Stop your promiscuity. Stop it now while you're young before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Today is the day. Today is the day. You may be here this morning. You've been having a wonderful time, enjoying life with no rules and no accountability, but I say to you one day, you'll come to your senses and you'll look back at life and the wasted years and you have no pleasure in them. Every day lived in rebellion against God is just one more day off your short life that will be calculated as wasted and lost in comparison to eternity. That's why today is the day of salvation. Don't wait another moment. Today is the day of salvation. Put the past behind behind you and reach forth in the future upon the grace and the love and the mercy of God and go forward rejoicing in Him. Today is the day because time cannot be retrieved. It cannot be relived. It cannot be a new opportunity or recaptured. So today is the day of salvation. Come to Him and receive Him and give Him your life. Say, Lord, You've got all. I'm Yours. Let's stand Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you, God, for your grace and your mercy and your love. Thank you, Lord, for this great church and what it stands for and this precious pastor, Lord, and his family. I pray for healing. Lord, I pray right now as we celebrate this glorious resurrection day, maybe there's somebody, Lord, that needs to come and receive you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak and move among us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, as God begins to speak to our hearts and the Brother 